Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have this uh, chance to speak uh, to an audience about this theme, and uh, particularly the idea of time for a reset. Really what we're thinking about here, and I'd like you to think about it, that this might be the perfect time for a reset. Because of the number of events going on in our, in our lives, uh, in this time in uh, history, it is an opportunity to reflect and look at what's going on, how we got here, and what we could do about it. So in fact, this could be uh, perfect timing uh, when we consider that. I think I will uh, give a little bit more at, of an orientation uh, of my own work and then have the other speakers uh, present. I'm going to just uh, give you a sense from an outline I come to this discussion of media from a perspective of anthropology, uh, particularly anthropology that looks at communication and culture and how they play out in the lives of what it means to be human beings and what this uh, does in our lives. I've been engaged in the study of understanding the communication technologies that have changed the world we live in from the writings of McLuhan, Sapir, and other uh, anthropologists and communicologists uh, and that without an understanding of media literacy, we are not adequately able to navigate our world. So it's a basic premise to what I want to understand about how did we come to this place? How did it get here? Uh, how did we move from the uh, troubadours going around telling stories to all of a sudden the Gutenberg galaxy, uh, the birth of Protestantism, the whole notion of the printing press, before we get into the image generation that you and I are now part of in this global media world. Since we live in a media literacy, media saturated uh, society, we have little influence over the content and form we are placed in. We are in a reactionary mode, uh, even with the advent of social media. We don't construct the media, we react to it. Uh, in 1993, I wrote an essay on media literacy entitled Media Literacy, The Time Is Now. Uh, again, that was 1993. Uh, it hasn't happened. <laughs> that is, maybe many of the participants in the audience don't even know what we're talking about. We will explain some of these things about principles of media literacy. But the fact is, we've been talking about our world's change. And the world has changed in a way that we can't take part in it. And whose fault is that? That is all something we want to discover because we can't change it without understanding exactly what's uh, going on with that. More and more, we live in fragmented societies without a public agenda. As such, there is not a public agenda or place for community, and neither politicians or the media provide a venue for citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy. Um, the compelling question really might be, in whose interest is it not to have a clear public agenda? Who clearly doesn't want a democracy and support democracy and work towards democratic principles of communication that make democracy possible? Please consider that throughout our discussions uh, today. So what is missing here is the form and content of media messages. Unfortunately, media and social media have been used to, for, to form a monologue. How do, uh, and in this monologue, how do we change media content from monologue to dialogue? It's not feasible under current construction. Rather than closed systems that have people shouting at each other, how do we actually create a medium that supports storytelling, dialogue, and conversation? How do we learn to listen to other stories? Dialogue does not just happen, it needs to be sought and nurtured. Trust must be established. My own work in peace building in Derry, Northern Ireland, uh, studying the peace accords says dialogue can happen when people are put into conversations of seeing each other's experiences as legitimate. And this is not left in the hands of politicians, corporate media that insist on some kind of winner take all, or even worse, thinking that our opposites are less than human and downright evil. The media encourage a kind of junior high brawl that behaves like, let's you and him fight. 
how can a responsible media develop that will look at true grassroots conversations? How can we bring together conversations that encourage cooperation, facilitation, and movement instead of fragmentation? I'm, I've just completed a study on fragmentation and, and look at the media and the media's role in, the, in this fragmentation process in the absence of this place where conversations can take place. Some of it's blamed on money, some of it's blamed on the uh, size of businesses. The reality is that journalism business has not been about dialogue, maybe forever. Uh, it can happen in regions of civil unrest where lives are being lost, like in Derry, Northern Ireland. The peace accords didn't happen because the politicians pushed them through. It happened because the grassroots participants in that society said enough, enough of the politician's point of view, enough of the newspaper and journalistic point of view. When do the people who actually been combatants in this battle talk about what their world is like and how they got here and how they want to get out of here? If it can happen in regions of civil unrest where lives are being lost, this is a good place to start for other democracies. Many have written about the levels of civil unrest that continue to ferment in cities around the globe, encouraged by political parties, social media, and dark media. Truth is removed by partisanship. It does not serve democratic processes. It is time to fix this before democracy as we know it disappears. A good place to start is with a new calling together for a more inclusive conversation with voices we have not shared the microphone to tell our stories and look for commonalities. Actually, democracy demands we make this change. That's my opening uh, kind of comments. And now I'm going to go to uh, Dennis. Thank you, John. Uh, firstly, it's a privilege to be with you all and thank you for inviting me. I think John's touched on a lot of the points that I want to build on. Uh, there is a widespread consensus that democracy uh, is in crisis. Um, there's a small library that's emerged on this over the past few years, much of it from the United States. Um, one, of the, my, one of the books I admire most is um, How Democracies Die by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. Uh, and the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and the Brexit referendum that year are usually given as the main symptoms of the crisis. But there have been many causes. Economic inequality, the effect of uh, globalization on employment, particularly in Western countries, the effect of the narrowing role for government under 30 years of neoclassical economics, fear caused by terrorism, and above all, I think, deep concern over climate change. And all of this has contributed to a, a deep polarization of politics, uh, polarization being one of the things John just touched upon as a crucial factor. And of course, it's all been made much worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. On top of that, there was already a declining trust in institutions, including the institution of the press, but this distrust has also been heightened by the pandemic. So why does this represent a time for a reset of the relationship between democracy and the media? Well, history tells us that at times of crisis, societies are more open to change than at times of settled life. Bertrand Russell, writing in 1934, which was by any standards a period of crisis, um, said this, idealism is the offspring of suffering and hope, and therefore reaches its, reaches its maximum when a period of misfortune is nearing its visible termination. Well, we can't say that the end is inciting for, inciting for the COVID pandemic, but who knows what the presidential election in November would deliver us. We saw how the world was transformed after World War II, which was another period of great crisis in human affairs. 
New international forums like the United Nations were established. The UN Declaration of Human Rights was signed. It was agreed that uh, the age of colonialism ought to be replaced by an age of self-determination among nations. Uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the whole Bretton Woods framework for uh, global economic stability, all of these things were established in the climate of idealism and hope that followed World War II. So the question is, could this be now another chance for transformation? The media is also being convulsed by change, of course, disrupted by the digital revolution and under siege uh, all around the world, not just in the United States, from populists who dislike the sort of scrutiny that the media is expected to exert on them. But if the moment for change is to be seized, and faith in democracy revived, the media, as the fourth estate, has a large role to play. And so the question is, how can uh, the professional media play its part? Well, a crucial factor is the interaction between professional mass media and social media. At present, elements of the professional mass media especially the Murdoch organization in the United States, in Britain and here in Australia, are interacting with social media uh, in a way that allows each to amplify and reinforce the other's most extreme content, which leads to a spiral, an upward spiral of outrage. And this only makes polarization worse. And we've seen uh, in a meta-analysis by another uh, American uh, scholar, a legal scholar called Kaz Sunstein at, uh, at Harvard, we've seen the, uh, the dreadful effects of extreme polarization and fragmentation that John referred to on democratic life. It makes polarization worse. It brings the echo chambers that we know exist in social media out into the wider public realm it makes divisions in the community deeper. So uh, we have an example here in Victoria at the moment on how this actually plays out. We see it in the coverage of the performance of the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, who's the equivalent of a governor of the state in the United States and uh, his management of the, of the pandemic. And he's taken four measures that have provoked hostility both on social media and in the newspapers and on the Sky news channel of Murdoch's News Corporation. A curfew overnight, extension of a state of emergency, extension of lockdown restrictions, and the mandatory wearing of face masks. Now, a chorus of Murdoch's Sky News nighttime rebel rousers have taken to calling Andrews Chairman Dan, which is consistent with a whole series of cartoons in one of Murdoch's newspapers here, which uh, which depicts Andrews in a Mao Tse Tung suit complete with red star on the cap. And the Australian refers to his pandemic response as health fascism. The Murdoch tabloids, both in Sydney and in Melbourne, have, have called um, Andrews Dictator Dan, which has an alliterative ring and found favour rather surprisingly with the Washington Post. And now Dictator Dan is also the name of a hashtag, and there's other hashtags too, um, and on social media, in association with these hashtags, Andrews has been depicted as Hitler, his head defaced with the characteristic haircut and the moustache. And when professional mass media, in particular, when it's as dominant as News Corporation is, engage in the same kind of extremism as we see on social media, they play into the hands of those who would divide us by their process of mutual reinforcement, social media and professional mass media turbocharge the crudely divisive public discourse, one of the causes of the crisis of democracy, which has been demonstrated very vividly by Cass Sunstein in his book, Hashtag Republic. And I commend that book to you if you haven't, if you haven't read it. So for that reason, News Corp's characterization of Andrews as a dictator, its references to him as Chairman Dan presiding over health fascism, pick up and feed into uh, the social media tropes that are dangerous to democracy. I agree with Levitsky and Ziblatt uh, when they say that democracy needs to recapture the 
egalitarianism, civility, sense of freedom and shared purpose that define its essence in the 20th century. The media can't fix all democracy's ills, but they can make a big contribution to all of those goals. And they need to reset their relationship with social media. They need to recommit to the basic journalistic ethical obligations of accuracy, fairness, and respect for persons. And they can use their gatekeeping capabilities, much despised, I know, these days, to exert a civilizing influence on public debate. But regrettably for the moment, the desire for clicks and eyeballs still seems to have some elements of the media in its grip. And when extremist debate fits with a media organization's own ideological agenda, commitment to ethical norms evaporates. And that's what I have to say. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, next, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Carolyn Cunningham, my uh, colleague uh, from Gonzaga. Okay. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me to this panel. I have learned so much just in our conversations preparing for this. Uh, John Caputo has been a mentor to me and has really opened my own eyes in thinking about media and the role media has in society. I've always been interested in uh, the sources of production. So I've always been interested in getting diverse voices at the table. Uh, I know when I look at media, when I look at news media, for example, I know that my stories aren't always depicted. And so I know that for a lot of people who are watching the news that they also feel the same way. Uh, but as both Dennis and John have been talking about, media play an important role in our democracy for informing us about uh, what's going on with our government, informing us locally and nationally, uh, and providing us with an opportunity to dialogue. Uh, I think Dennis did a great job of talking about uh, one-way forms of communication, especially as social media has amplified some of these uh, ideas. And so what I'm really thinking about when I think about this topic is how do we get more diverse stories out there? Uh, and so when we were preparing for this, uh, we all said, let's bring a provocative question to the table. So when I was thinking about this and preparing about uh, this uh, presentation, I was thinking about diversity. Does diversity matter in delivering facts? And I know that several of you had sent in some uh, pre-questions related to fake news and misinformation. And I know that we are all very interested and engaged in thinking about that topic because uh, it's, it's hard to break through, right? It's hard to figure out what what to believe, uh, especially when we have this dynamic of information overload. Uh, people are sharing information without necessarily uh, verifying it. Uh, but does diversity matter? If news is reporting the facts, does it matter who is delivering it? Um, and I would argue yes, uh, but I'm sure in the Q&A we might uh, have a lively debate about that. So I just wanted to provide some uh, statistics related to diversity ownership in media. Uh, we, we haven't talked too much, too much here about media ownership, but I think that's a really big context. Uh, we see increasingly media consolidation. We see a small handful of media outlets that control the, the majority of media um, uh, broadcasting. And this really dominates the kinds of messages that are created and those that are uh, distributed. So just I wanted to provide you with some statistics. So uh, here we see that if we look at my minority ownership of media, we see that in 2013, only 3% of TV stations were owned uh, by people of color. Um, African Americans owned just nine TV stations across the country. Uh, that's not a lot. 7% uh, of newsroom employees are black. 12% uh, are uh, in radio are black. Uh, and only 6% of news directors are black. So if we're thinking about ownership as perhaps helping to promote diversity, we also see that there's such a limited amount there. Uh, and if we think of positions of leadership of helping to uh, form and make decisions about which stories get told, uh, we see that there is low uh, representation there. Uh, so we see, uh, I wanted to talk next historically. Uh, this is not a new issue. This is something that we have been talking, at least in the United States, um, at least is since the 1960s. So if you're familiar with the Kerner Commission, that was in the late 1960s. It was a report uh, 
an advisory board was uh, putting some information out to President LBJ about uh, the state of civil unrest and racial relationships at the time in the late 1960s. And the Kerner Commission, the reason why I wanted to bring that up, um, identified media as uh, as not helping the situation. Basically, the way that media were, were reporting on the race riots at the time were actually not helping people to understand the, the very issues that were surrounding what was going on. Instead, it had uh, the opposite effect. It reinforced people's belief. And I think I'm hoping as I'm, I'm talking about this, that you're seeing some connections with how we're seeing reporting on Black Lives Matter, for example, and some of the recent protests that are happening in, in the US at this time. So we've known this has been a problem. And as I've just showed you those statistics, we see that media ownership and minority ownership is still considered, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, and so I also wanted to show this as, as kind of a sense of how media can uh, frame or shape uh, people's perception. So uh, as I was mentioning before, we were talking about the role. My question I posed was, does diversity matter in who delivers facts? So here is a picture. This was around the time of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, this was really resonant to me because I was teaching at the University of Texas. I was teaching and a lot of my students were actually being evacuated from Louisiana and coming to the University of Texas uh, to take classes. And so this was really, like I said, resonated with me. And if you look at this picture, you can see how, oh, it, it's a little bit cut off in the bottom there. But, um, but if you look at this picture, you can see how, um, you know, if you just look without the actual uh, uh, caption on the, on the right hand side, you see an African American man with uh, in the water, wading in the water, chest deep with a uh, trash bag and a, a, a a bag, a box. Uh, below, you see a white man, and there's actually a white woman. Sorry, the picture didn't come up very well, but also carrying things uh, and wading through the water because it was a, a, a tragic time. And if you see on the top here, the caption is a young man walks through after looting a grocery store. Uh, the same sort of activity uh, without having any other context is, is presented in the bottom picture as basically finding. So finding some things just happened upon them, wading through the waters uh, and doing this. And so we can see how um, this already, this kind of captioning primes us for how we're supposed to see the image. And here we can say this is just very um, discriminatory and not helpful in helping us to better understand what is happening and seeing how racial stereotypes are based in, in there as well. So I just wanted to show that as an example of how, why this is important. Um, I have this GIF here that I wanted to show because uh, I'm also study a lot related to women in media. And so this, uh, this kind of rolling image is showing you how, uh, this is actually a global study, looking at the ways in which women's stories are presented in media. And we see that, actually I thought this was astounding, in 2015 only 24% of news stories are about women globally. <laughs> I, I found that to be astounding. I know I had a hunch about that, uh, you know, but when I look at it on this global scale it's, it's very, um, it's, it's very disturbing. Uh, women only make up um, about 19% of experts who are quoted in media. So not only are um, that we have this problem of women are underrepresented, at, uh, underrepresented as the reporters, but also in terms of actual um, uh, actual stories about them. And I know that uh, my time is going over here, so I just wanted to um, think about this in relationship to um, democracy and media because we're coming up on the election cycle. Here uh, we can see that oftentimes women uh, in politics are represented very stereotypically. They're often seen as too emotional. Uh, Kamala Harris is a good example uh, of someone who is often seen as too emotional in and is she fit for office, for example. And then this one I wanted to also bring up, um, oftentimes it's not about uh, policy issues that women are putting forth. Instead, it is about um, it is about their personal lives, and so we don't even get to hear sometimes what it is uh, that that is on the policy agenda of, of female politicians. 
Uh, so I guess I invite you guys to think about that question about diversity that I posed at the beginning. Uh, I look forward to the q and I, I have so much more I want to share with you, but I know I don't want to take a time away from the other panelists and just thank you for having me. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Uh, we will come back to many of these themes as we move through this and then move into our Q&A. But let, now let's have uh, Frank Baker uh, speak to you uh, from South Carolina. Thank you, John, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, th thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this very important and timely discussion. I'd like to start uh, with a brief personal story, if, if you will. After working in television news for nine years, I found myself working for the Orange County Public School System in Orlando, Florida, where among other things, I was the buyer of the films and videos that the teachers used in instruction. Well, imagine my frustration after sitting in several classrooms to watch educators use these materials when I witnessed no teacher engaging students in any critical viewing skills. I later researched this issue to find that it was part of what we now know as media literacy. Skip ahead, 1999, I was attending a national media literacy conference and I decided that I would conduct a state-by-state -state analysis of all 50 states teaching standards, which was published in Education Week, in which I was going to look for evidence of media literacy in all 50 states. And what did we find? We did find elements of media literacy existed at that time in almost every state standards. But now, many years later, with the adoption of common core standards by some 42 states, media literacy in our schools is virtually non-existent. Adding insult to injury, we don't test media literacy, so it's not taught. Our colleges of education, for the most part, have failed to provide new teachers with any media literacy instruction. In South Carolina, where I reside, the recent statewide assessment revealed that most middle and high school students failed at the ability to assess the credibility of information. And echoing that, a RAND study this year found roughly nine in 10 secondary teachers who were surveyed indicated that students' inability to evaluate the credibility of online information was a problem. Stanford University researchers, after studying students' poor online habits, concluded that their inability to process the internet is, and I'm quoting here, a threat to democracy. Thomas Jefferson famously said, and I'm going to paraphrase here, the health of a democracy depends on an informed electorate. I'm here to say, folks, we're in trouble. There is strong evidence that many people, including young people, aren't adequately informed. Adding to this problem, newspapers are folding. People's trust in the media has been eroded. Social media has become that breeding ground for trolls, fake news, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and more. Right now, as I speak, there are people and groups, foreign and domestic, working to create content designed to shock and influence, content that will be shared around the corner and around the world. We now know that deaths and serious injuries have resulted have been caused by false information online. Last month, the FBI warned Americans of dozens of suspicious websites which resemble official election websites, but which are bogus. Before joining this webinar, I listened to Congressman Adam Schiff on CNN speculate on what might happen if Donald Trump loses the election and refuses to leave the White House. And following that, on the excellent PBS NewsHour program, a long segment on the impact of the replacement of top executives at Radio Free Europe and other similar agencies, with one former executive saying now that the situation there is both chaotic and uncertain. Folks, these are tough times for sure, but all of us must support strong, 
independent journalism. I like to say if it weren't for the Washington Post and the New York Times, among others, we wouldn't know half of what we know about Donald Trump and others in his DC circle. Earlier this year, in February, I spoke to a large group of school librarians who I do wanna give a shout out to. In fact, we may have school librarians listening, participating. I am a, a big fan of the school librarian who among other things, teaches information literacy all over the United States. But I'm also aware that there's been a trend to lay off librarians. And when that happens, we are eliminating a, a big ally in the, in the fight for more critical thinking students. So in my talk to school librarians, I put up on the screen the word verification. Verification. I said not enough students and others are bothering to verify what they read. So social media contributes to this problem, as we all know. And I think we need to learn how to verify, to learn how to question sources, which is what media literacy is all about, which is what I've been teaching. And, and we have to continue this fight. We have to strengthen teaching standards, and we've got to make the policymakers more aware of how important media literacy is in a 21st century world. Uh, time is running out. I, I feel like uh, media literacy is like the, the climate change. You know, everybody's been waving the red flag about climate change and people are starting to pay attention. Are they paying attention to the disinformation, the fake news, the conspiracy theories, uh, the lies that come out of the mouth of the President of the United States, the continuous disinformation that comes, we've got to be paying attention. And so uh, it's gonna take more than just Frank W. Baker uh, doing workshops with teachers. It's gonna take every one of us. And in fact, I'd like to ask everyone listening to this webinar, uh, if you know a principal, if you know a school board member, if you know a superintendent, I'd like you to communicate with them. Send them an email or talk to them if you see them after church. What are you doing right now today to provide my students, my children, with the critical thinking skills they need to navigate the world in which they live. I don't see enough of that happening. And so I'm a champion of media literacy. I've been running the Media Literacy Clearinghouse website for more than 20 years. And the website is my name, frankwbaker.com. And I write a regular blog at middleweb.com in which I look at popular culture and the news and make the connection to media literacy for our teachers. So again, thank you, John, that you organized for inviting me. I look forward to our discussions tonight. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Frank. We'll come back to these thoughts as we move to uh, Sandy now, who brings a new perspective for us uh, as well. So welcome, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. And, um, you know, as I thought about what I wanted to say uh, as an opening, uh, my thoughts are more personal in, in terms of, you know, why, why did I get involved in this um, industry in the first place? Uh, and so I was reflecting back on about 30 years ago, I was invited to be on an advisory committee for our local newspaper here in Spokane. There were three people of color who were a part of that advisory committee and our job was to bring in a community perspective on what was being covered in the newspaper. And so uh, very quickly into the process, uh, the three of us raised the issue of the representation of people of color in the uh, newspaper. Uh, what was being shared about people of color, particularly black people, what was being uh, covered um, and so after much discussion, the newspaper decided that what they would do was commission a study, have one of the university, local universities do a study on what the representation of people of color was. So that wasn't very satisfying to me. And we met once a month. So what I did was spent the next month clipping out pictures of every time I saw a black person in the paper 
over the next month, I would clip it out and stick it in a little baggie. And um, when the month was over, went back to the meeting, took my little baggie with me and dumped the baggie on the table and said, there's your study. So it was no surprise to the three people of color sitting in that room that the representation of us was criminals, predominantly, um, athletes, and entertainers. That's what we got. Um, lately, there's been sort of a trend towards finding exceptional, and I'm going to just specifically talk about Black people, but finding exceptional Black people who, have, who are sort of different from the rest, um, and then finding uh, black people who are victims of some sort of tragedy who are helped by white people to become exceptional black people. So those are our sort of memes, if you will. So the reason that I decided to start the Black Lens newspaper five and a half years ago was because I wanted to counter that narrative. It was my intention to spend my time producing a newspaper that offered an alternate view of people of color, particularly black people, um, so it was supposed to be just a paper filled with happy, positive black images. That's, that was my goal. Um, I didn't make it through the first issue um, because in the first issue, I ended up having to cover a story about use of force against people of color in Spokane um, that when it was covered by the mainstream media, uh, they made a big point of saying that there was no racial bias. Um, and I found that fascinating because my background is social justice and grassroots organizing. And I thought, well, that's fascinating because either Spokane's unique amongst the entire country in that there's no racial bias or that's not exactly true. So I got the, the report that had been reported on in the paper and I read it from cover to cover. And in fact, what it shared was that use of force was three times higher than it was supposed to be. And, but the right author of the report decided that that did not indicate racial bias. I thought it did. So that became the very first article on the very first page of the very first issue of the Black Lens. So my desire to just tell happy stories went out the window very quickly. And the newspaper became about something else. And so that's why media and democracy are important to me because um, despite our current president's best efforts to demean the press and discredit the press as much as he can, the press still has a tremendous amount of power um, to influence thought processes. And I think it's critically important that as we're looking at the role of media in our democracy, that we are keenly aware of how stories are told and who's telling the stories, which is what Carolyn was saying, who's, who's in charge of the stories that are being told and how those stories are told. And so that's why um, this is a very, very important subject to me. One of the first questions is, how does the media combat false and misleading information without repeating it and reinforcing it? It's not a question of whether you report on false information. It's a question of how you report on it. Uh, if you simply regurgitate it as false information, uh, then, of course, you're just making matters worse. But if you report upon it and you point out that it's false information, and you provide the proof for why it's false information, then you are serving the public interest. So as in so many of these things, it isn't a question of whether you report it. It's always a question of how you report it, how you contextualize it, how you frame it, I suppose, is one of the jargon terms. And if you frame it as false, and here is why it's false, then you're doing a service. Just to pro probe you a little bit more, what if people still don't believe you? What if, their report, what if they read that report and still feel like it's false? I don't think there's much we can do about that, Carolyn, to be perfectly frank. I mean, we live in an age where there's a, a breakdown in the distinction between fact and faith. Uh, and that's unbridgeable by, by ordinary intellectual means. So all I think we can do is present people with facts. Now, I know there's a ton of research, a lot of excellent research in the United States that shows the more you confront people with 
facts that contradict their beliefs, the more they hew to those beliefs. I don't think you can do much about it. Do you? I, I, I don't know I also, why I asked you. <laughs> I, I also think from my uh, opening kind of comments, uh, when uh, I went to study uh, peace building in uh, Northern Ireland, I thought, well, how, I, under, I only understood what happened in Northern Ireland from my university days as an undergraduate student. I didn't study, I was interested in peace, but I didn't understand the war. I thought the war was about uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants. <laughs> I, I thought it was about, I thought it was uh, rather simple. I thought about it rather sim in simplicity uh, because the stories that were told and the stories that filtered to the United States, uh, in fact, carried that story. It wasn't until I actually spoke to participants, combatants, that I started to understand it was a story of civil rights. And it was a story of civil rights that were, was not going to be resolved. And how could I, in fact, uh, engage in dialogue? How could I listen to a person who killed my father? How could I admit that I did X? Or how could I, how could I, could I? Well, it really came to be that we needed to understand and trust a person to tell their story before we can start to share an understanding. And so these people who... Uh, uh, you know, there's a book, old work on open and closed mind, uh, those kind of things. Yes, they're all, they're all true, but the reality is the opening up of the mind requires this process. And yes, unfortunately, it takes time. But we dug this hole, so we need to sort of fill it back if we're going to uh, get to, at least that's from my perspective. And that reminds me, Sandy, something you said. I think maybe our paths must have crossed. I think I was part of that study uh, that looked at, did a photo audit of the spokesman review, uh, particularly looking at the representation of people of color uh, in, in the paper. And so we did, it, uh, we did that study, that audit, audit process, uh, media audit. And yes, we, in fact, we found just what you just said. That's right, right? That yes, people of color were in the paper percentage wise population of the city of Spokane, but where were they in the paper? Who told that story? Uh, and like you said, sports, uh, entertainment, crime. Front page, business, no, no representation whatsoever. And in, and in fact, even on pages like um, wedding anniversaries, no representation, like, <laughs> like they we're not people of color having an anniversary. Well, it was a whole different kind of issue about where did, how did stories get collected and so on. So I think we had a parallel uh, kind of finding on that. But, it, the, but the reality is some of these boundaries have to be opened up. And I think that's a challenge uh, to us here. A lot of you've touched on this, but what, what is the big role that media plays in democracy? And why does democracy even need media? So um, people of color are not in the rooms where decisions are made for the most part. And um, so media then becomes our eyes and ears. Um, and I would argue not just people of color, but a vast majority of the country are not in the rooms where decisions are made. So media becomes our eyes and ears. And so the role that media plays is so that we can, as a, as a population, can trust that what is visible in this democracy is in fact what's actually happening. Um, because I think there is not a lot of trust in that, and in some cases justifiably so. So I think that's one of the roles. The other, the other role is a role of accountability and um, challenging the status quo and sort of challenging what the um, majority narratives of or why things are. And I'm gonna show this. I'm low tech, so so this is a uh, a issue that I published uh, not a couple years ago, and I didn't even have a story with it. All I did was publish. This is a snapshot of Spokane's decision makers. That's all I did was put the pictures in there, um, and it clearly told its own story. Who's making all the decisions in Spokane? 
And so I think that's the role of media in a democracy is to ask hard questions, to hold the powers that be accountable and to be the eyes and ears for, uh, for the population. I do an activity uh, with, with young people in, in which I distribute um, photographs from uh, current events, uh, news photos without captions. Uh, because for the most part, they don't have a clue how the news gets made. They don't have a clue what the job of a photojournalist is. And uh, uh, I, I tell them um, that the photojournalist is our eyes and ears. They are our witnesses to history. So they take the pictures, uh, they may edit them and write a caption and deliver them to uh, the news agencies, which we then see in the newspaper, the magazines, online uh, and uh, on television. But that's not, not the end. It's up to, to us, all of us, to apply some critical thinking skills to, to what we are seeing. Uh, as a, a, a little example, I use a photograph of Barack Obama standing in the Rose Garden uh, at a ceremony advocating for the Affordable Care Act. And to the left and to the right of the president are four people all dressed in white lab coats. And without a caption, I ask uh, students and teachers, what do you see? A very simple visual literacy question. Well, I see the president and I see doctors, they say. I say what are, what, what's your evidence? that they're doctors, where they're wearing the white lab coats. So my next question is, did the doctors who showed up at this Rose Garden event, did they show up wearing their white lab coats? Or do you think the White House distributed the white lab coats? And everybody thinks the latter. And I have to remind them, we were not there at this event. We did not witness it personally. We depend on that photojournalist to take the picture. So the next day's news, is the photo of Obama with the four doctors. But the New York Post published a different photo of a White House staffer handing a coat to a doctor who neglected to bring theirs. And so we do have to question what we see in the news, but also as a media educator, I realize that most students only know what they see on the screen. They don't have a clue how it got to the screen. So I wanna pull back that curtain and so I'm happy to enlighten them about the role of the photojournalist, among many others. And so I, I've seen a growing trend in the United States to something called the News Literacy Initiatives. And I hope everybody that's listening who may not already know about news literacy might Google it and you can find sense. Well, what, one thing uh, I, I'd like to add uh, to, to Frank and uh, Sandy's comments, uh, uh, go back to something you said earlier, Frank. We, we uh, thanking the uh, uh, New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. The, the problem is, one of the problems with young people, particularly, and the need for this, is we talk about digital natives. So therefore, we think they understand, they know, they can, young people are very sophisticated about, well, the, re the reality is, no, they're not. They're digitally cynical, but we don't need cynicism for democracy, we need to find those things that help us move forward uh, and understand the problems that exist in our society uh, that we could contribute to. So why does democracy need media? Uh, it, we do live in a media saturated uh, world to the question or Cindy's question. And if we don't understand the media, if we don't understand how these messages are constructed or who's interested uh, in that, uh, it's always like follow the money. But after you follow the money, there's these other issues. Why? Why does uh, uh, President Trump only want to speak to small select base people in his organization and ignore the rest of society, even though the rest of the numbers are much larger than the group he's talking to? It, it's about fragmenting and winning through fragmentation. Gerrymandering's about that. So we need media to help let us see and understand what people are passing in back rooms. We need media. To, to, to have access to information that we don't have access. We can't as individuals go into court and say, show us the information. We, we want to discover what would actually happen in that, but we're not gonna be able to do that. As a democracy, 
we need media to be representative of the democracy. Uh, unfortunately, this is back to my criticism of, of media. I love media, I consume and I study because I, I enjoy it. Uh, but the reality is most media in the United States was profit motivated, profit generated. The whole idea of that they were going to serve a common good uh, for everybody is not at the base of why corporate media actually has hurt democracy. And, it's, and it was in their own interest to not support democratic processes, because in a capitalistic system, it's easier to have authoritarian government. It's easier to have people who have control of that. Uh, and so it was in the media's interest to generate profitability now they're suffering, right? I have this book that maybe uh, some of you are aware, Ghosting the News, uh, Local Journalism and the Crisis of the American Democracy. It's by uh, Margaret Sullivan. It's an excellent book, but the reality is she's still thinking about all the newspapers that are closing down. Well, why are they closing down? Why didn't they do something before now? Where, where has that been? Well, their owners were interested in profitability. Were there writers interested in profitability? No, they were interested in making a living. They were interested in having a fulfillment of their wish to tell stories that made a difference in our society. But no, the corporate ownership, and uh, Dennis talked about uh, uh, Murdoch and so on, even uh, nationally, that corporate is hurting us. These days, for example, uh, New York Times and Washington Post have been surviving uh, this ghosting the news but primarily because they become mega papers who are doing something to the world. But when you go to their website and look at some of the trash they're actually putting up and mixing in with that stuff, it's like, well, it's all about profit again. So the problem is where my own thing about this was just, to, I said this 20 years ago or longer. Uh, I guess I am really getting old. The fact of the matter is when um, grocery stores went to owner-operated the grocery stores, that's what should have happened in journalism. That is, take it out of the corporate control, take it out of that place where it's all about profit, find people who want to write and tell the stories and do that job, and give them a living, honest, good wage, and you would have lots of people wanting to do that job, just as Sandy's doing. And I want to say, as a compliment to Sandy, um, the, for whatever reason, the local paper is not necessarily corporate, but pretty close. And uh, they are now sh sharing some of Sandy's stories. Black Lens is making it into the, into the local uh, uh, major newspaper for this region of the country. And it's nice to see because they're very, Sandy's stories are very different than the kinds of stories that are in there, right? Uh, have you got much feedback on that, Sandy? That would be a good thing. That kinda, you yeah. answered one of the, I want to jump in there because the next question I think ties right into what you're talking about is, is about the diversity. And why does it matter to have diversity in who delivers the news? And I think that touches on it. I think briefly why I would say it's important um, to have diversity in who tells the story um, part of the reason that the Black Lens newspaper is called the Black Lens is because I was walking, I was trying to figure out what to call the paper and I was walking through the living room uh, and a news story came on the television and I don't remember at this point even what it was. It was probably about a criminal because that's typically when you see black folk on the news. But I was walking through the living room and I stopped and I, and I listened to the story and the thought that went through my head was, boy, I bet that story would be different if it was told through a black lens. And then it was like, bing, 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 that's, that's the issue. And so that's why, and I think people, I think you're not even aware of the difference unless you see the difference. And so I do a, a workshop on a racism in the media where I show examples just from how my paper covers something and how the spokesman covers something. And it isn't a slam on the spokesman, but it's just, it's totally different. And I do it by showing photographs. Um, this is what I show and this is what they show. And so um, there is a perspective and I don't think that um, people necessarily are aware that there's a difference in perspective unless it's presented to them. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, and I would just agree with what Sandy is saying. There's a lot of research um, 
related to who who's telling the story and what a different lens it it lends to it <laughs> lends to it. Uh, so I would just echo that too. And then I guess I would also add one thing we haven't touched on, but a little bit is the media effects. Sandy had mentioned uh, that media have a way in forming people's opinions and forming the way that people uh, orient themselves to information. Um, and so when people are not seeing stories about themselves in the newspaper, uh, then they feel erased and they don't feel like their perspectives matter. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of distrust in media. Of, uh, you know, I think this was has been going on significantly in the past four years. Um, and, and then we see, as John was talking about, the ghosting of the news and the lack of local journalism. And so people are feeling distrustful and not seeing news as very reliable. And this is uh, exactly what uh, Frank was talking about in terms of a crisis of democracy. Um, if we think about, I was talking a little bit about women in politics, I wish I would have had more time. Um, but we see when women in politics are represented by the way they look, uh, by their personal life, not by what they're actually saying. They're criticized by the way they actually sound. There's a, a research study I was reading today about how women's voices are actually criticized, the, the tone of their voice, because it's not a ma masculine voice. Um, that, that not only, that sends a message to potential women who wanna get into politics, that if they're going to, they're gonna be the site of uh, public scrutiny in a different way than men. Um, and so that, to me is also a crisis of democracy, that it sends a message uh, to, to uh, people that they, they don't belong, that they don't, get to, they don't get to be part of the center stage either. Yeah, so I think that's a very important thing that you both ra raised it before, and that is representation in the media. The media is important because it does show representative of society. And when they eliminate these groups who aren't present, it gives us a false view of what's going on. It gives us a false view of who matters. It gives us a false view, but that's what we know because we see it on television. We see, you know, it's like 30 years ago, did we get in this battle with uh, Iran and uh, Americans said, well, I didn't know people don't like Americans. Where, how did that happen? Well, they were too busy being entertained by, by watching uh, survivor on television as opposed to what real survival is about in the global village. The reality is that part of the world isn't exposed to us. So there, that therefore we don't know that story. And, and as uh, Carolyn or maybe uh, Dennis talked about these sort of echo chambers we live in, yeah, I could go out in the other room in my uh, family room, I could turn on CNN or uh, I'd be in this echo chamber where they're saying all these wonderful things about the, well, they'd be talking about the evilness of the other side, and then they'd say all the good things. Of that. But that's not the reality either, because then I start to wonder, well, who are all these people? This guy raised his flag on his property that he loves this candidate, where I think that that candidate is an actual idiot. <laughs> I'm going to jump in here, John, because we got lots of questions. Oh, yeah, let's go. Thank we're not going to get to all of them. I apologize to everyone. I'm going to start getting some of the ones that are in the window um, in the, that that came up. First of all, Dennis, um, somebody asked the book that you recommended early on. What was that book that you recommended when you first spoke? Uh, it was a book called Hashtag Republic. That's the hashtag mark, you know, the, the, the thing over the numeral three, and then Republic. Uh, it's all lowercase, and um, the author is Professor Kaz Sunstein, S-U-N-S-T-E-I-N at Harvard. And the next question is, that they talk about that um, there are some gatekeepers for smaller social media, but who acts for the gatekeepers for big media? When they set the agenda, what is the system of balances to keep big me media to those ethical norms? Or do they have ethical norms? Because... Um, John and others had mentioned the money issue and corporate control. So are there any gatekeepers to big media right now? Yes, there are. Um, all of the professional mass media have gatekeepers built in to positions of news editor and editor and chief of staff and all the decision makers of the organisation. Uh, who keeps them to account is an unresolved question in democracies has been uh, all through the, the ages. Um, all we can rely upon with the gatekeepers is that they would adhere 
to uh, the sort of ethical norms of the profession. That is a very uneven performance in, in, in your best newspapers, in your New York Times, your Washington Post, your LA Times. I think the gatekeeping is probably on the whole very high, pretty much as it was on the papers that I worked on, the Times of London and the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age in Melbourne. Um, but it very much is driven. The quality of the gatekeeping comes down to the internal culture. And that touches on something John's just mentioned about the money problem. Now, where you have strong um, separation between the uh, commercial side of the, of the organization and the editorial side, where that culture is strong, then the gatekeeping, I think, is on the whole reliable and truthful. Where you have it otherwise, where the commercial fortunes of the organization impinge upon the gatekeeping, you have basically professional corruption. And you, the, you get a mixture of both uh, across the world. The next question ties into that. In the 1930s, Sinclair Lewis wrote, it can't happen here how fascism came to America, wrapped in a flag, carrying a cross and called it patriotism. Um, is it already here? And also, did the Powell memo set the stage and plan for corporate takeover of the government? Does everyone know what the Powell Memo is? The Powell Memo was written by Lewis Powell back in 1971 to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It was basically attack on the American free trade enterprise, and it set the stage for corporations and business, big business, to get involved in every aspect of our government from legislative, executive to judicial, as well as to have control in the universities and education. Um, I think it has had an impact, um, though, it, it, and this has been rolled out the money issue. So um, what about that? Do you think that fascism is here? Um, do you think the money has won? What is it? What do you think? It's a uh, scary question. Go ahead, Dennis. Um, I, I think in certainly uh, here in Australia, we have a quite strong public sector broadcasting sector. I, I broadcast on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which is government funded, although it has a, a, a legislated charter which gives it independence. And we have a, a special broadcasting service, which is also public sector broadcasting. You have it too in your, um, in your public broadcasting service in national public radio and others as well. Um, I think that where you have an element of that then you've got some usually fairly small antidote to the money problem. But of course, the vast amount of media is, uh, is private enterprise for profit. Uh, and coming back to the point I made a minute ago, where the internal culture allows for the commercial interests to impinge upon the editorial decision making, then you have a problem. I do want to add one note to the Powell memo. Lewis Powell was a, a couple of months after he wrote that he was appointed to the Supreme Court by Nixon. And within a few years, we had the decision Buckley versus Vallejo money equals free speech. That's just a side note there. Um, next question. Um, I just wanna, can I jump ahead, in real quick? Yeah, so I just want to jump in real quick about fascism. So, you know, I can't say whether fascism is here. Certainly there are elements that are of fascism that are here. What I would say is I'm more concerned about um, what I'm perceiving as laziness on the part of the general population. And here's the example. When I first started publishing the newspaper, I used to do blog, I used to take the top two or three stories and I would do a blog post and I would post them on Facebook because I was trying to tease people into the newspaper. And I got a comment from somebody who said, <laughs> and I quote, boy, I'm glad you're doing that blog post because it sure is frustrating to have to read to the bottom of a story and then it makes you have to turn the page and you have to turn the page and go to another page to read the rest of the story. And at that point, I stopped doing blog posts because uh -huh. I, I will not be complicit in, in creating a culture where it's too much work to turn a page and educate yourself. So I, I'm, that's my concern. So, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about the onset of fascism if we have a population that is engaged and educated and ready to act on what they see. And I'm not so sure we have that. 
I think the next question would be good for Frank. What is the definition of media literacy? literacy? Uh, there are several, and I'm going to give you a narrow definition because I am an educator. And on my website, the Media Literacy Clearinghouse, I define media literacy as applying critical thinking to all media messages. But as the panelists know, and probably many uh, watching and listening, uh, media literacy is, is, is a huge, huge topic. Um, when I was putting together the Media Literacy Clearinghouse, I created a list of keywords that I thought media literacy um, was involved in. Things like bias, advertising, propaganda, representation, gatekeeping, agenda setting, um, uh, commercialism, body image. Uh, I could go on and on and on. So, so media literacy is really, there is a definition that I'm fond of and I'm not gonna be able to repeat it word for word, but it comes from Ontario to the Ministry of Education in 1998. They said media literacy is concerned with the techniques used by media makers and the impact of those techniques. And I really, really like that particular sentence in that word. But more than anything, I like to tell educators uh, and others that media literacy to me is this tree with two big branches. One branch is analyzing media messages and the other is creating media messages. So from my perspective, a lot of our schools are engaging young people in making media, which is great but they don't in involve them in analyzing media messages. So in my own work, that's exactly what I try to do with educators. Let's analyze a photograph and let's, let's create one. Let's analyze an advertisement, let's create one. We have to engage people in, in, in both, both ways. Um, I wanna go back to news for a moment. There was an activity that I did years ago where we would take the, the sections of the newspaper with students, even though they don't read the newspaper today, and we would use two markers, one pink and one blue, and we would circle all the names of the males and then all the names of the females. And I think you can guess what we came up with. And you can still do that same activity. So Carolyn's graphic about who are the voices, who is heard, who is not heard, I love the expression for young people, finding the me in media. And as we've just been talking about, when they don't see themselves, they don't feel valued. And so media literacy is this huge thing. And, and it, uh, the definition is changing because media is changing. Uh, my colleague, uh, David Buckingham says, we need to be teaching people about how algorithms work. Uh, we need to teach people about privacy and transparency. We, we need to widen that definition. But the problem is we're not even teaching basic media literacy in K-12 in the United States. And so until we get there, we can't get to the other stages. And I don't see educators going, yeah, that's a problem. I, you know, my kids are coming in believing that headline in social media. And, 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 and Sandy talked about laziness. I had a teacher tell me, Frank, my kids don't care if it's fake news. And I said, well, if that's a widespread sentiment, then we better deal with their apathy. And, you know, we only have, we're go this is going really great. There's so much stuff to talk. I wish we had three hours to talk about this, but we only have about 11 minutes left. And I want to shift and make sure we get everybody in here on this one is what do we do from here? What are the potential solutions? How, how do we get a pro-democracy media? What does that look like? Where do we go from here? And maybe we can just go around um, and have everybody answer this one. I'd like to hear from everyone. How about uh, start with you, Carolyn? Great, thank you. Um, I think one thing that we can do is train our journalists better. So if we're not getting more diversity in, until we get more diversity in the newsroom, we need to be training journalists on how to uh, understand their own biases on reporting on particular topics and particular issues. I think that would go a really long way. I think we need to um, 
have media outlets similar to what uh, Sandy had done monitor their own behavior. Uh, once once an organization knows what it is they're actually reporting on uh, and, and the ways they're reporting it, then they can make change. Uh, but if, if it's all under the guise of objectivity in some way or journalistic standards, uh, then perhaps we're not getting there. I think we need to support local and um, not-for-profit media as much as we can, uh, as much as we can, and find diversity in the sources that we, that we look at. Those are just a couple of the things that come to mind when I'm thinking of that topic. Great, how about, uh, let's go to Dennis next. Uh, two things, I think. I, I support Carolyn's proposition that a great deal of hope can be rested in local media. And that's partly because it's so closely in touch with its communities, but partly because certainly the experience in Australia is that, that local newspapers are not as profit driven as big corporations. They don't answer the, to the stock exchange. They don't have to produce growth in profits. They are, they are content with a sufficiency with, with a, a living wage as it were. So I think it's going to be a, a bottom up um, change. And I think that, support for local newspapers is crucial. But at the top end as well, I think there does need to be a macro a recommitment to the fundamental ethical obligations of journalism, verification prior to publication, fairness of representation, um, respect for persons. You know, those sort of basics of journalism ethics need to be recommitted to by all journalists at every level. Uh, Sandy, you wanna go next? Sure. So I was looking at the question, um, what does a pro-democracy media look like? I was thinking about that. Um, so what I came up with um, raises questions, holds those in power accountable, encourages critical thinking, seeks out and highlights diverse voices and perspectives, not waiting for them to drop out of the sky, but actively seeks them out um, so that a diversity of perspectives can be offered. Um, and, and this is the one that I thought was key, um, that media sort of has been in a role of being a, sort of a, a, a step back kind of an impartial observer of, of the, the, the community country that it covers. And I think that's part of why some of the trust has been lost. Um, but I think media needs to develop a relationship with the community that it's covering. Um, I think it needs to be more of a dialogue than, than um, um, one way. And so I think that's something that key that needs to happen. And I just have to say this, if we really want, to, want a democratic media, we have to support it financially. People have to put their money where their desire is, you get what you pay for. And if independent media was actually being supported and it became financially lucrative, to have an independent media that encouraged critical thinking and had articles that were deep and investigative, if that became financially lucrative because people supported that, then you better believe the mainstream media would start shifting in that direction. So I think that the public is the driver and I think we need to know that we're the driver and start owning that and start doing something about it. Great, thank you. Frank? I'd really like to see, um, all news organizations recruit more young people. And what I mean by this is don't just recruit college students to, uh, to, to, become, uh, to become working a journalist. I'd like to see more organizations uh, work with middle and high school students to tell their story. How do I, as a reporter for X newspaper, go about doing what I do? I don't think our young people get an opportunity. I've said this for years. We never, we don't put kids on a bus and take them on a field trip to the ad agency. Yet advertising is a huge part of their world, right? We don't put them on a bus and say, we're gonna take you to the newsroom and show you what happens. Why don't we? Let's pull back the curtain on how media work. And that's a great way to recruit them, talk to them about careers, get them involved in covering issues that are important to them, and, and see and hear more young people in the national news. I, I, I applaud the PBS NewsHour, for example, because it has a, a student reporting lab that and some of their stories end up actually on the air. I want to hear from more young people. They need to see that their, their words 
um, their sounds, uh, their views are, are valued. John? Um, from my perspective, um, uh, something uh, uh, Carolyn said earlier touches on this. That is when we have young people learn to make media, they become more media literate. When they understand how these stories are constructed and the difference between real life and media reality is quite separate kinds of things. And so we have to find a way to do that. And part of that is what Sandy and Carolyn also said. How do we allow, how do we open up? How do we get more voices? How do we get more stories told? Where is the place that we can share our stories? So the sharing of our stories, for me, reaches the point of dialogue. And it is in dialogue that we can develop democracy because democracy demands that we take into account people's perspectives. Right now, as I said, we're shouting at each other. We're in this other sort of place, but it is possible to go back and do that. In the last question, I think is an important one. I do apologize to everyone for not getting to everyone's questions. We just had so many questions and we could, like I said, could talk about this for hours. So what can people do to encourage change in the system. You, you've touched, many of you have touched on a little bit, but what can average people do to encourage more de uh, a democratic um, media? And let's um, go in reverse, John. I, I would say here in Washington state where, uh, where we're located, it's important to support media literacy. You know, uh, all the time I've been studying this, it's sort of like, the United States has been sort of like a third world uh, country as opposed to first world because we really have never, somebody has kept us from understanding the impact of media on our lives. And so now we need to take the reins and do something about that. So support media literacy, support here in Washington state. We have a new bill passed through Olympia uh, Public Schools on media literacy and digital citizenship. If you're in Washington state, this is something you could promote and help happen. And anywhere else you are in the world, support this, support media literacy if you wanna have an informed public making good decisions. Great, uh, Frank. I, I'm gonna agree with John. Um, there's a group called Media Literacy Now, and you can go to their website and they have recruited uh, folks like me and uh, others in states to get legislatures to pass media literacy laws, basically, getting the departments of education to make sure that media literacy is taught. Now, a, a lot of these laws that I'm seeing don't have a, a lot of teeth in them. Uh, you, you know, they want to study media literacy. They want to have an advisory group. You know, we want it taught. So we have to have professional development, K-12. We have to have materials. We have to help teachers see where the media literacy fits in every discipline. It's a huge job, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we've got some wonderful models, including Dennis there in Australia, uh, where the Australian teachers of media have done some fantastic work, also in Great Britain, and our colleagues in Canada, where media education is mandated in almost all of the provinces. So we've got good models, we just don't have uh, the, the political will, the educational will, to get media literacy widespread. So I'm with you, John. We've got to support media literacy. Uh, just one thing, one to add to Frank. These countries, Canada, Britain, and so on that he mentioned, Australia, they actually were reactionary, concerned that American media was so much influencing their country, they had to become more media literate just because if, if their populations were going to consume this American product, it's a very harmful product. So therefore, help them become more media literate. We weren't doing that because nobody was encouraging us as a country to look at our own media. It was take it for granted, it's entertainment. It's only entertainment. And well, it's money-making operation. <laughs> and we know it's a big money-making operation too. Yeah, right. Sandy. Uh, what people can do, read, 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 read. Uh, in this country, it was punishable by death for black people to be taught to read. And that speaks to the power of reading. Um, and so I think as adults, we can model the importance of reading newspapers, not just American newspapers, international newspapers, to young people. Because if we tell them that it's important and they don't see us doing it, 
then it's not going to pass down. Um, I do think there's an interest amongst young folk. We have to encourage that. I agree with media liter literacy. I think it's critical. Um, and we have to create avenues for that to happen in school, outside of school, primarily in the homes. I think that's really important because it has to start there and then spread out from there into the rest of the country. Great. Dennis? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Get used to paying for news again. That's a great answer. Yeah, definitely subscribe to your local newspapers. Definitely. Carolyn. I guess I would just echo everything. It's hard to follow what Dennis was just saying. Uh, but I think, you know, being on the board of the Northwest Alliance for Responsible Media, people don't know what media literacy is. I mean, I think probably Frank has this problem too. Uh, they, he, that, that word doesn't resonate. So I think what you can do is share this information within your networks to grow it. I, I think word of mouth is a nice way to do this and to share some of the information that you've heard today and just kind of on a small scale, you know, you can influence a few people. I think people think media literacy is like criticizing what kind of media you watch. But, uh, you know, as we've talked about, there's more to it. So I'll just end there. That's wonderful. I just want to thank you all. I am putting links to everybody's um, that's here tonight, Northwest Alliance for Respons Responsible Media, Northwest Center for Media Literacy, the Media Clearinghouse, uh, Black Lens News, and Fix Democracy First. I just want to thank all our panelists, Sandy Williams, John Caputo, Carolyn Cunningham, Dennis Muller, and Frank Baker for being here tonight. This was a very wonderful conversation, and please share this. Um, and maybe we need to do a part two to come back and answer all those questions we didn't do. So let's talk about maybe doing another round of this in the future. But thank you so much to everyone for being here tonight, and I appreciate you all. Thank you for all your work. Good night, everyone.